Okay, so continuing off of our previous um, discussion, uh, I want to provide a little bit more details on the indirect utility function and the expenditure function. Um, we can make a cool, yeah, a nice little graph about this. Um, oh, yay, that's a cool color, but I'm just gonna stick with black. So um, here is, again, our indirect utility function, and this is our uh, expenditure function. So first, um, the interpretation, as we just talked about, is um, for the indir uh, indirect utility function, we're maximizing utility at prices P income Y. For the expenditure function, we're minimizing expenditure for getting U bar, uh, utility under prices P. Awesome. Um, and now we want to, uh, so, so I guess this is one column. Let's also talk about partials. Um, they're like pretty special. So again, we talked about Roy's identity and Roy's identity um, gives you that the relationship of partials in the indirect utility function is equal to the Marshalling demand. So more specifically, it says that the negative ratio of the partial of the indirect utility function, indirect utility function with respect to prices over the, indirect, the partial of the indirect utility function uh, with respect to income is equal to the Marshallian demand function. For the Hicksian demand, we get that uh, we get that Shepard's lemma tells us that the uh, the derivative of the expenditure function with respect to prices is equal to the Hicksian demand. Um, so these are very useful identities that we could um, employ and. There are also very intuitive explanations for these. Um, next, we talk about sort of the shape of the function, so the monotonicity um, of both functions. Okay, how, how do I spell? Okay, um, I promise I can spell monotonicity. Okay, awesome. Um, so the indirect utility function, function is non-increasing in prices, uh, and this is intuitive because um, you know, the, the, the higher, the more expensive a good is, the less utility you're going to derive from it because the less you can buy. Um, it's also non-decreasing in Y because intuitively the more income you have, the more goods you can buy and the more goods you can buy, the happier you are. Um, similarly, for the expenditure function, it is non-decreasing in P. Um, that's because um, for a higher level of prices, um, I have to spend more money um, to get that same level of utility, um, at least, yeah, more or the same. Um, and it's also non-decreasing in U-bar, which means that if I want to hit a higher level of utility, uh, that means that I would need to spend more um, or the same. So notice that we're not saying like, we're saying non-increasing instead of decreasing because there's a potential that it could be the same. Okay, next about homogeneity. Uh, so this, remember, recall from a few lectures ago from Professor um, Glazer, it was just, we, um, homogeneity says if we, you know, um, take a scalar multiplication of our inputs, do we, can we still get a scalar multiplication of the output? So um, for instance, we have V of lambda P comma lambda Y is equal to V of P Y. This is basically saying if I scale up my prices and my income by the same amount, then uh, I'm still gonna get the same utility. So this is like, if I buy in dollars, um, that's the same or else equal as buying in yen because that's just a basic unit conversion and that's how Professor Glazer says, you know, inflation doesn't really matter um, in the ideal world or in the frictionless world because everything scales up by the same amount. Um, however, you know, there's our reasons for taking macro because there's all these other frictions and um, nominal stuff doesn't exactly translate to real stuff immediately. So there's all this, you know, slack and stickiness. Um, which is why you should take macro. Basically, this is just the homogeneity requirement. Um, and for the expenditure function, we have that E of lambda P, um, U bar is equal to lambda E P 
of u bar. So this is saying, um, so if I increase my prices by a constant vector, that just means I have to spend proportionally more. Um, and that should also make intuitive sense. Um, next, we talk about continuity. Um, and so, I mean, so both are continuous. This is kind of obvious. Um, there's kind of no reason why it wouldn't be. Um, so yeah, why not? And next, um, we talk about the curvature of the function. So the indirect utility function is quasi-convex in P or um, in both prices and income. And uh, the expenditure function is concave in P. So remember our definition for concavity was that, uh, how do I insert a page? Okay. Yes, sorry. Um, right, so our definition for concavity was that um, this, uh, if you take an arithmetic average of two points on the function or uh, you would get something, then if you were to put that average into your function itself. So that's saying uh, lambda a plus one minus lambda b, that gives you this point is less than uh, a to the lambda p to the one minus lambda. So this is for the Cobb Douglas space. This is also saying that the arithmetical average would be less than the geometric average. Um, this corresponds to the geometric average, and this corresponds to the arithmetic average. Intuitively, uh, you can also think about this as e of, uh, right, e of um, lambda a plus 1 minus lambda b. Okay, so this is like the risk case. So actually, let's not talk about this because this, uh, this has to do with risk aversion, um, and we'll see that for later. But um, quasi-convex is saying uh, lambda a plus 1 minus lambda b is less than the max of um, the two things. So remember our typical case for this is quasi-convex. Um, quasi-convex is just saying that um, my linear combination or my convex combination is less than the max of both things uh, versus the typical convex case, we just have that uh, my arithmetic average is greater than my geometric average. Um, so regularly, we would have for um, just pure convexity that this is greater than, say, alpha to lambda, p to the 1 minus lambda. So that's the exact opposite from this case. Okay, so that was a lot about interactive utility functions and